Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you very much to the organising committee for the opportunity to come along here this morning to speak to you. And I guess my conclusion right at the beginning would be we certainly do need more, and it would be in the form of food, amongst other things. The title that uh, the organising committee gave me, Food from Plants versus Food from Animals, which is most sustainable, I, I really didn't know how to address this title when it was offered to me. And... Uh, a number of weeks ago, about two weeks ago, I was at a conference in Poland and over a beer I said to a bunch of young ladies who were with me uh, that I was given a presentation in Italy and this is the title, uh, how do you think I should address it? And they said to me, it's a stupid title, don't bother. Um, so I thought, I thought, hmm, I'll try that one. Uh, so in the abstract, I, I deleted which is most sustainable and I, I replaced it with sustainability uh, matters. So, in terms of what I want to uh, emphasize to you, really, uh, four key areas. Um, there's a major refocus on sustainability and all the broad dimensions of sustainability. Um, I'm going to note to you what we currently consume as, as consumers, what, what are food consumption patterns working at a global level. And then I'm going to highlight some of the issues in the plant sector, some of the issues in, in the animal sector with a major focus on the animal sector in terms of big challenges in relation to sustainability. But overall, plant and animals are fully integrated, and we need both. And that's why it's very difficult to actually address that title. When we look at uh, food from plants, of course, plants are excellent in terms of converting a energy from sunlight into, into plants, into products that we can consume directly. But of course, in terms of our animal products that we produce, then they're heavily dependent uh, on plants as feeds to enter into our animal food chain. And as we heard in the first presentation this morning, increasing dependence in aquaculture on the importance of plants. So they're very much interrelated. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the big challenges in, in that, that we are all facing, and you are all aware of these issues, but I'll summarize them for you. Issues to do with uh, global population increasing increasing towards 9 million by 2050. Currently, we're just over 50, uh, uh, five, uh, uh, 7 billion people in the world, moving through to 9 billion by 2050. This is a major challenge. It's not new, but when you look at the context of how we produce that food and recognize that we're going to have to produce that food in a way that's completely different to what we've done over the last 50 years, the challenge is very large indeed. Urbanization is a very significant problem. More people living in urban areas, less in rural, gives a whole host of problems associated with it. One, there's less land to produce food on, but also we have uh, changes in, in the diet that people consume. We have the nutrition transition uh, to consider as, 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 as well. But our food system is failing on sustainability. Uh, agriculture has major challenges in terms of, for example, uh, water. 70% of, tot of total global water uh, is used in, in agriculture. Of the 11 billion hectares of vegetated land uh, in the earth, there are major challenges to do with soil erosion uh, and major losses in biodiversity. And then there is the relationship between agriculture and its direct contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, being somewhere in the region of 12%, and if you include the indirect contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, then it's somewhere in the region of 30%. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, it's extremely important when we consider the current discussions between the relationships between greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Whether you believe in climate change or not, then I would argue that certainly we're all experiencing increases in climate variability that is related to what you can answer that question. But the models are predicting that we're going to be faced with increasing uh, variability in climate and it's indicating towards a warmer 
a world with various predictions up to the end of this current uh, century. So the contribution of greenhouse gases and whether they do influence climate change, yes, you can debate it, but it's a very, very big political and scientific agenda at the moment that we certainly cannot ignore, and all industry is looking at their footprint. And the way in which the footprint of foods is examined uh, is quite often presented using these sorts of figures here in terms of emission intensities uh, the units along the bottom there are kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents per, kilo, per kilogram of product. And those kilograms of CO2 equivalents consider the major greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, nitrogen, um, uh, methane, uh, for example, all converted into one unit. And you can see there across a whole range of food products from potatoes through to uh, red meat products um, and, and milk in the middle there, that the intensity of emissions for animal-based products generally uh, tends to be higher, but not always. You can see that, that tomatoes in here is also very high. So we're being challenged with this sort of evidence base by people who do um, a life cycle analysis, and basically we look at this and we say, well, what does it mean? Well, what it means here, if you look at it, is the numbers are higher for red meat, for, for beef and sheep, and that's bad. So as scientists and animal scientists, we need to get to grips with understanding what these figures mean, and, you know, are they correct? I'll come back to this uh, later in the presentation. Some of you might be aware of a report that came out from UK government uh, in 2010, the on the future of food and farming, and it was headed up by the government chief scientist, uh, Sir John Beddington. I would encourage you to have a look at this report. This report has had a major impact in the UK in terms of the future in food and farming, but I would also suggest to you that it's leading the way in Europe and globally in terms of the big challenges that, that exist uh, in our society. And that top line there summarizes really what we have to do we need to produce more food from not much more land than we currently got, using a lot less water, a lot less fertilizer, and a lot less pesticides than we've done over the last 50 years. And there's some very hard messages in this. But, you know, the game has changed dramatically. And this is the new arena. So agriculture needs to meet the, the demand for food whilst being careful about the impact that it has on our environment, on human health, which is the subject uh, of this cost action in, in, in many ways, very important angle. But we also have to deal with the fact that we're not just producing food from our land, we're also having to deal with where's our water coming from, where's our energy coming from, where's the feed for animals, and where are the fibres coming from to make products that we are used to. And we have to do this against the backdrop of increasing variability in climate. So let's have a look over the next few slides at food and where it's coming from. 80% of our energy intake comes from plants at the moment, 20% from animal products. These are the figures now, globally speaking. And there's huge variation in these figures depending on the part of the world that you're in. There's only 12 plant species and five animal species that are providing 75% of the world's food. And in some parts of the world, wild foods are, are important in the diet of many people, estimated to be around a billion people in the world. So that's out of seven billion, currently dependent on wild foods. Now, break that down a little bit for you using the FAO stat data 2009 in terms of where do we get our energy from. Then you can see that really most of the energy is coming from, from, from plant-based products. In terms of the cereals, we are heavily dependent on three, wheat, rice, and maize. So if you look up the top hand side, you can see the extent to which animal-based products uh, are important in our diet. But again, I re-emphasize huge variability dependent on where you are in the world. 
Similarly, you can look at the, the data for, for protein on a global scale, and again you see that plants are an extremely important part of a provision of protein to people. Briefly, just to highlight some of the issues within the plant sector, one of the big debates relates to the fact that there's increasing pressure on crop yields. They're beginning to stagnate. And we're beginning to see many situations over time where production is lower than consumption. And this is a very serious issue in the, in, in, in the plant world. And I live and breathe uh, the air of a lot of people who talk this sort of stuff in, in, in my own uh, university. So increases in crop yields, big issues in there. There's huge variations between potential and actual yields. A lot of that is exasperated uh, by the fact that in some countries, including the UK and further afield in, in Europe and in developing countries, really we've got major problems to do with uh, getting our technical knowledge, our current knowledge, out into practice and getting access to it, and there are big economic and political uh, situations in, in there. But even if we could just partially address that point, it would play a very significant role in addressing uh, the gap that exists in terms of potential and actual, uh, actual yields. And it's estimated that if we could reduce the yield gap, uh, an increase in potential yield, we could, we could increase crop production by about 50%. Okay? However, that does not take into account the fact that, that those plants are now being directed increasingly into fiber production and into biofuel production. So there's a big tension between food, fuel, and other uses, potential uses for those products. And at the end of the day, that will come down to economics and who's willing to pay for it. I want to move on and focus on big issues in, 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 in animal agriculture. I want to make the point as animal scientists, which were largely in this room, I think we're extremely poor at defending the role of animals in society. This slide attempts to put together uh, a whole series of points that are all positive for animal agriculture, and I think we fail to promote the positive roles of animals in society. There are many. And too often we are on the back front defending the position uh, of animals. We're responding to lobbyists who say they're bad for the environment, they're bad for your health. We need to change that and become more positive. However, to highlight some of the big challenges that exist in the livestock sector uh, at present, we're all aware on the right-hand side there that the demand for uh, meat and equally for milk is increasing, both in developed but particularly in developing countries. It's estimated that there'll be a, uh, an increase of 68% by 2030 relative to 2020. But also it's recognized that the livestock sector is a very important user of land resources. Grazing land is 26% of, of the land surface. What else are you going to do with that land if you don't use it for ruminant animals? But also uh, the livestock sector uses 33% of the crop, crop land dedicated to producing feed for the livestock sector. And most of that feed will be going into the monogastric sector, into poultry and into, uh, into, in, into pigs. So even though there are many positive attributes, and I'm a big fan of this, in terms of the benefits of animal products in our diet, some of the big challenges that exist, we really must get to grips with. And I want to highlight a couple of them to you now if we're going to continue to be able to defend and promote animal products in our diet. So I'm going to focus on two issues. One's the feed challenge. What are we going to feed animals on? And two is the environmental challenge. And then I'll make some conclusions. In this slide, it highlights to you uh, the production 
on the top of the table there of meat, milk and eggs in million tons in 2005. If you focus on the right-hand side, you'll see that basically it's 1,025 million tons of meat, milk, eggs produced uh, in, in the world. That's the amount of uh, cereals, and this is just cereals, that's going in as feed into those livestock uh, systems. It's estimated by 2050 we will need an additional 1,050 million tonnes of feed, of which half of that roughly will go in as feed to the animal sector, and half of it will go in to, the, to, the, to feeding directly to man. The increased tension for feed, the competition for feed for that cereal is going to increase. I think the role of human inedible materials, forages, crop residues, food fiber, processing byproducts in animal feeds will have to increase substantially. I think it's one of the biggest issues that's going to, uh, is currently affecting our industry and will further affect it with time. I think there will be increasing dependence, particularly in the ruminant sectors, on what we can achieve from forage-based production systems. We will have to do more from that land at a global uh, level. The issue of protein equally is, is, is challenging. The demand for soya increased 3,000% in China since 1990. There is a major problem in Europe in terms of where it is going to get its protein from. There is a major uh, protein gap. And I'll highlight uh, some data from the UK for you in terms of where we currently, in the UK, get our protein for our animal feed systems from. We use about 2.6 million tonnes. 37% of that's coming from homegrown cereals, 3% from peas, uh, peas and field beans. 55% from imported soya, 5% from imported maize. We are heavily dependent on imported soya, and so is the rest of Europe. We have a major net deficit in, in protein, and this gap is likely to get bigger as the demand for soya increases, particularly in China. How are we going to deal with it at a European level? It's a major issue. Some of the ways we could deal with it, really, are to increase the amount of protein we currently produce from wheat, barley, field beans, peas, etc., etc. And in this slide here, it shows you what we would need to do to get up to the amount of protein that can be produced from a hectare of soya. Currently a hectare of soya will produce 1.33 tonnes of protein per hectare. So to achieve that figure, we would have to have these sorts of increases in, in yield and or protein concentration in those crops. Now, it's a major problem. We are very vulnerable to protein. To move on to the environmental impact uh, issues, I've already hi highlighted to, to you the importance of greenhouse gas emissions. This is a very important political and scientific agenda at the moment. Agriculture is an important contributor, and in some countries, such as the UK, they now have a low carbon economy as the central spine of their, of their economics. Okay? A central driver in government economic policy is low carbon we will reduce our footprint or else. So it's also important to note that greenhouse gases are, ex are very different to diffuse uh, and particulate pollution, which is more local. Greenhouse gases is global. It needs global action. To go back and show you some of those emissions intensities down the left-hand side here for a range of animal products, pork, chicken, beef, milk, eggs, you can see that those figures in particular are high for beef, equally for sheep meat. 
If you look at the land requirements to produce a kilogram of beef, it's also very high. But you'll also note that there's an awful lot of variation in these figures. In terms of where do these emissions come from, we know uh, in the livestock sector, it's primarily related to enteric fermentation. It's methane, it's the rumen. It's related to animal manures. And the big chunk on the left-hand side is what's called livestock-related land use changes. This is the indirect contribution of livestock agriculture to greenhouse gases. This is land that's been taken out, it's been converted into arable ground to produce feed for the livestock sector, for example. To go back to those figures, there's also huge variation in the figures using beef as an example across countries. We have to understand why that variation exists. And is it real? What is it all about? Equally, to finish on this point, to showing you data from two farms in Wales, one's an intensive lowland farm, the other's an extensive uh, organic farm, and you can see that the emissions intensities are much higher uh, on this farm, which is the organic extensive, relative to the, relative to the uh, intensive lowland. These are major issues which we've been challenged with. And what are we going to do about it? You know, all industry sectors are being told, demanded, to quantify their greenhouse gas footprint by 2014, and then government, at least in the UK, will look at doing something about it. We cannot ignore this. There's huge uncertainties, we must understand them. We cannot risk doing nothing, and we must get solutions to do this. And the solution, very simply, is we need win-win uh, solutions. We need to produce more, but emit less. That's the science agenda. Just briefly to introduce, though, a positive story. This is some uh, data which Maggie Gill in the UK often presents as a positive story for ruminants. In terms of energy efficiencies in USA livestock systems, this is data on the energetic efficiency, the conversion, of, the conversion efficiency of energy in feed through to energy in product. So you will see on a gross energy basis, then beef is much lower than pigs and poultry meat. However, if you convert that and consider where the energy was coming from in the feed that was used in the diets, you will see that in terms of the new calculations, then all the numbers increase, compare the left to the right, but you will also see that the numbers substantially increase for beef and for ruminants, because of course they can convert non-human edible feeds into animal products and it's a very important story. So to conclude with, in terms of what we need to do, you know, the challenges for food systems are, are, are very large indeed. We need food systems which are much more resilient, resilient to climate change, for example. Last year we experienced dramatic rainfall in the UK, substantial variation in weather patterns. We're having to learn to farm in a very different way. How are we going to do that? We have to reduce our dependency on the use of fossil fuels, oil, fertilizers. We have to protect our environment, what's known as ecosystem services, soil, water, air quality. And we have to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, produced by food. And some of the targets that are in there is by 80% by 2050. So to go back to where I started with John Beddington's um, report in 2010, he described what was, what's called the perfect storm, where we need more food, but we also need more energy, and we also need more water as a society. And we're having to do this against a backdrop of increasing variability in our climate. Food environment, fibres, major social issues to achieve that. We got limited resources in terms of land, nutrients, water and energy. We're going to have to think very differently 
and we're going to have to work very differently if we really are to address this agenda. So I'd just like to re-emphasize to you uh, that at least in the UK, but I think it's much wider now, the whole research agenda has changed dramatically to fit this sort of landscape. And what it means for us is we no longer will be able to work in silos doing our own, our own interesting little scientific subjects, but we're going to have to change and we're going to have to get, for example, not only working with other people and other disciplines in the natural sciences, but we're going to have to also work across the people in the social sciences to actually get to grips with this agenda. The challenges are large, but with a challenge comes excellent opportunities. I wish you well with it. So send me how, information on how you get on in about 20 years' time. Thank you.